Okay, it looks like we are live. Let me just check if that's so. Oh, yep, we seem to be here. So welcome again to my office. If you're wondering why we're in my office, uh, once again, we have illness in the community. Thankfully, not COVID, just the flu. And uh, just to be wise, because we have so old people and small children, we don't want to put them in any kind of risk. So just for this week, while everyone's coughing and sneezing and carrying on like that, we'll... Uh, just not meet face to face in our usual way and hopefully we'll be back to that it was supposed to be next generation sharing but since it's them that's mostly sick that we will just that they'll still share but it'll almost certainly be next week or as soon as they will okay so we don't want people to be burdened while sharing with being so sick they can't think straight or talk straight so stay ready to hear from them i'm sure that'll be great when it comes so i had to you know wasn't planned that i'd be here so i had to really pray and ask the lord what is it that we should share this week and the topic is since you can see since you say that you can see what kind of limits are on that and what kind of accountabilities come with that because as we are talking about walking on the narrow way the only way that leads to life the way that jesus went down first and showed us by example how to walk there are limitations on us because we're just human even though we're born again we're still fundamentally human and there are accountabilities you know, the covenant comes with things that we're accountable for. So I just want to look tonight at the, that aspect of things. And really, it grows out of what we've done for the last three or maybe four sessions. So we're going to start with a tiny bit of revision from last week, just to refresh our minds and to add a few things that we didn't quite cover from John 6 last week. So first, let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us together. I thank you most of all, Lord, that part of your covenant promise is that a man will not teach his neighbor to know you, that you yourself will be our teacher, that you will write your law in our hearts and minds. Indeed, no one can come to Yeshua, to Jesus, but that you first draw them so it is indeed by grace, even though we have things to do and we're accountable for certain things. It can't even start without your grace. It can't even start except that you draw us first by your Spirit before we even know Jesus exists. As it is written, you will be found by those who are not seeking you. You come as a surprise to many people, as you did to me when you first called me. So, Lord, I pray for everybody in New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Philippines, in Africa, in Korea, in Ukraine, in Russia, and everywhere on the face of the earth where your remnant remains, where someone who can still be saved even now, even in these dark days, even if there's just one left, Lord. Be there, I pray. Remember your covenant. Be jealous for your blood. Be jealous for your shame, your word, your name, your way. And act with whatever force is required, Lord, to snatch them up, to drag them away before they perish, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, ah, oh, just on one thing. So in prayer lately, Two or three times the Lord has said something to me which won't mean a lot to other people but for me it's like particularly I nearly said disturbing it probably is disturbing for me but he said I'm going to open a door that no one can close and close doors that no one will be able to open 
and this is said this to me repeatedly and that I was to not worry that he was going to not just open the door but carry me through it whether I had the strength to go or not. In other words, he was going to sovereignly bring me and by me, by extension, that means you, if you're also a disciple, because we are we're a body, I am not anything without the rest of the body, right? So what exactly that means, we have to wait and see. However, why it's slightly disturbing is I'm very familiar with that it's scripture. It comes from the book of Revelation and it comes from the particular part of Revelation that God has promised me three times so clearly that I wrote the dates down in my Bible next to it. And I would look that up and show you, except presently my Bible is holding the camera up, so I can't do that. <laughs> that was silly of me, but anyway. So anything out of the out of the book of Revelation, of course, you don't, you know, it's not for playing games with, so it's serious stuff. So, yeah, a prayer. If you can remember me in prayer, then really ask the Lord to refine my understanding and to, you know, I want to cooperate and I want to be in the middle of his will and I want to be reflecting his word about whatever that is. And it seems to be that it's very soon. So I guess we'll see what that is as time goes on. I just thought I'd mention that and just ask for prayer because like you, I'm just one of the sheep. You know, nobody special sitting in this chair. Nobody better than you, nobody less. Just we're just the same, remember? All parts of the body. So if you have your Bible, please turn to John chapter 6. Put my glasses on so I can see it better. This is where we were last week in part. And we're going to verse 41. 41 to 47. So it should be familiar from last week, but we just need to make it fresh in our minds to understand a few things. So verse 41, therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. He's referring to the manna in the wilderness that fell every day. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. That's what I pray before from Jeremiah 31, that God himself will be our teacher. Moriel, remember. Moriel, the Lord, um, God is my teacher. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. So we, did the, we looked into parts of this last week. Remember, we focused, really, we focused on verse 44, which is, No one can come to me unless the Father draws me by his spirit. So remember we, we look at the meaning of that and we looked from Matthew 9 about Jesus. It, it, the whole thing was the calling of Matthew, remember? And why did Matthew a tax collector? All Jesus said was, follow me. It wasn't even a clever, you know, it wasn't even a clever sermon or anything like that. It just says, follow me. And we were discussing and we were seeing from the word what happened to Matthew was what Jesus is talking about here. That word drawing, remember, helkuo, means not just a, a subtle, um, not a subtle hint, <laughs> but a powerful, a dragging, that the Holy Spirit drags you, if needs be, by whatever force is necessary to Jesus opens your eyes so that you can see him. Maybe not not in a physical sense, but 
where what you couldn't see before was but was always there suddenly you can see it takes away your spiritual blindness to realize that not only does God exist but there's just one and there's only one way to him to be a disciple of Yeshua and he's making you this offer come follow me that's why Matthew leaps to his feet and follows we did all that last week so if you if you haven't seen that just go back a video and you can learn all about that and please do something that's not in the written notes for today but I'm just going to mention briefly because I think it might be good for a topic later on he says everyone who has learned from the father comes to me this is actually a statement that tells you that Jesus backs and uses Midrash if you're not familiar with Midrash again if you're watching this and you don't know what that means it's, it's the Hebrew word that really just means to inquire so it's the name for the Jewish way of understanding scripture as taught by Rabbi Hillel the school of Hillel and that school at the time of Jesus was run by Rabbi Gamaliel who appears in the book of Acts as the wisest rabbi in the land that even the Sanhedrin would dare not argue with and he had a star student his top student was a guy whose name was Shaul from Tarsus Shaul well you know Shaul of Tarsus that's the Apostle Paul so the Apostle Paul is an expert in the in the particular rules for understanding scripture as taught by Rabbi Hillel Midrash Paul uses it Jesus uses it and here he's doing it he says everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me well how can you learn from the father of Jesus how can you hear him because he says everyone who has heard the Father and learned from the Father will come to Jesus well it's Midrash it's, and let me translate it into modern English there's only one place you can hear God the Father speaking it's the Old Testament how does he speak through the prophets well how do you know what the prophets said well it's all written down it is the Old Testament the whole of the Old Testament is God the Father speaking and what does he say he says I'm going to send a shepherd from Ezekiel 34 I'm going to send a shepherd to rescue my flock from the useless priests the priests who are worse than useless who make themselves fat at the expense of my flock trample them and leave them for dead while they just get fat and look after themselves I'm going to send my own shepherd and he will be God himself and he'll be one in the line of David it's all in Ezekiel 34 right so the Jews came to understand that this shepherd was coming and they call him the Messiah this the anointed one Hamashiach right the anointed one that's what Christ means in Greek anointed okay Christos so what Jesus is saying there is that if you bother to understand what the Father said was going to happen if you realize what God had already said in the Old Testament if you have the Old Testament as the foundation then when you read the New Testament you keep going ah that was supposed to happen ah he's supposed to be like that <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying. Those who bother to really understand the Old Testament will naturally come to him recognizing that he is exactly who God said he would send, that he is who he claims to be, and he does only what God said his shepherd will do. Fulfill the law and the testimony, that's the law and the prophets. You know so that's we could make a whole study out of that but that's all I'm going to say about it for now but since we're in John 6 it'd be silly not to mention it okay silly not to mention it anyway let's go on so 
we looked at Matthew 9, and the other thing I want to just bring back to your memory from there was, remember when Matthew brought all his very sinful friends to where Jesus was having his dinner? And remember the Pharisees and even the disciples of Jesus were pretty shocked and horrified when Matthew brought all these sinners into the place. And Jesus, who was reclining, eating reclining at the table, wasn't offended. The re religious Jews would have told them they couldn't come in, get out. Your sinners, get out. This is a righteous house, you get out. They're looking at Jesus and he's not doing that. <laughs> he's just reclining at the table eating. And remember we remember we learned that hang on, I'll just get rid of this. We learned that reclining at the table is actually a particular thing from Passover and it's specifically taught at Passover that you must eat reclining because that is what free men do. Slaves, the slaves, remembering their time in Egypt, slaves have to stay standing ready to serve. But the free man is able to take his meal reclining because he's not a slave. So what Jesus was doing, if you remember from last week, he is deliberately displaying that whilst all these people have come into the room who are slaves to sin, you know, so there'll be demons with them, there'll be all manner of evil following them. You could say the house has become, might become unclean because of their presence, but Jesus is not, he's not deterred by any of it, and all he's doing is maintaining a posture that says, I am not a slave like them. I am free. The power of sin it does not enslave me. That's what freedom in Christ is, actually. It's the ability to live a relatively sinless life. No one can be sinless, but a relatively sinless life. Because your will, you have the option, a freed will, that's able to make righteous choices and to choose holy options. Whereas an unsaved person has no free will. They are slaves. Sin controls them. You know, and having worked in social services, I can, can tell you that, that never a truer thing was said. Unsaved people, sin absolutely controls them. They are out of, they are out of self control completely. That's why one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is self-control. It's one of the main fruits of the Holy Spirit, evidence that you're saved, self-control. So that whole business of being, sorry, I keep hitting knocking this, um, it, the whole business of being in the world, but not of it, as Jesus was in that room physically, but not of what was had come into the room. There was a separation, which, remember, the word, the Hebrew word for to be separate is kadosh, which we translate as holy. God says, be holy because I am holy. This means don't be like the world. Be separated from it. Be apart from it in character. Be apart from it in spirit. Be apart from it in your choices and your behavior and your standards and your view and your morals and everything else. Even though you are still physically in it. And if you recall from last week, what Jesus was really trying to show them is that holiness being separated had nothing to do with location. <laughs> you know, you get these crazy, dangerous cults. They go and build a commune in the desert. Or we'll go and live in a cave or under a rock or something. And they try and physically separate themselves. It's not the biblical meaning at all. Because that's fear-based. You know? They are, they are so afraid of what's with the wicked that they think the way to make themselves safe is to physically hide. You know? Well, if you need to physically hide, God will tell you. He, he had Joseph and Mary take Jesus to Egypt to keep him physically safe from Herod, remember. So there's a place for that, but it's not the general case. And if you do need to, if God does say physically hide, he can certainly tell you, don't you worry. But 
really remember how can anyone gain faith because faith comes by hearing the word of God and how will they hear if no one tells them you know this is the instruction in the epistles right so of course it's never God's intention that his people live on an island or in a commune or something like this or in a monastery with a door locked we must be amongst sinners we are meant to be in the world just not of it wholly separated but not geographically separated in spirit and character we looked at all these things and I hope you know I hope all that made sense last week otherwise go back and go over again but the bit I wanted to focus on tonight was there's a tension a wrestling match between God's will which is the Savior and your will which is <laughs> to be your own God and to run after your own agenda and if you need saving save yourself right using what you think you need to do to have the life you think you should have you should you should you should as if you knew anything you know it's it's written and it's true that the that the dumbest part of God is is infinitely wiser than the wisest part of man humans are fairly stupid objectively speaking we think we're so clever but if you look at human behavior and things especially things going on right now it's just announced today that in Germany they've made a new law that you can just go down to a registry and without any kind of you just fill in a form and you can officially change sex for legal purposes so if I wanted to, I could be a, legally a girl tomorrow just by filling in a form. That's it. And in Germany, legally, I'd be a girl. So I could, you know, I could go into the girls' changing room at the, at the swimming pool and no one could stop me because legally, I'm a girl. And they, this is meant to be a great idea, right? They're all clapping and cheering and saying how wise they are and how clever. But honestly... Have you heard anything quite so stupid in your whole life? See, humans were not very clever. This tension between my will and what I think is best for me and what my goals are and what I think is more important and what God says is important and His will, which is to save me firstly from myself. You know... God isn't just, it's a good question to ask someone, who is God saving you from? And it might surprise you that the ultimate, what's the ultimate answer to that question? The ultimate answer is God is saving you from himself. Because if you're not saved, once the judgment comes, he doesn't have in his holiness and his righteousness, he doesn't have any option but to throw you into the lake of fire if your name is not written in the book of life. If you're not the disciple of his son, into the lake of fire you go you know so ultimately that's who God is saving you from himself his own righteous law but after that probably the next biggest danger to you is yourself your own pride your stubbornness your human nature which thinks it can do it without God that it can do it better than God etc etc so when we talk about freedom, freedom actually in many ways is when God frees you from your own stupidity, when he frees you from your own ego, when he frees you from your own stupid pride and stubbornness and arrogance and causes you to be humbled so that you can see yourself as you really are in, in the light of him and then all of a sudden this offer to save you becomes incredibly important to you because when you realize that apart from him it, 
it's hopeless. Nothing you do is going to mean anything in the end. You remember I gave the example of the fruit flies I used to have to maintain in the science laboratory. You know, they get born, they eat, they reproduce, and a few days later they die. Their whole life cycle's less than a week, leaving no trace of, really, after a while, no fruit fly remembers the fruit flies from last week. They're just gone like they never were. Well, that's mankind. Really is. So, if you don't want your life to be meaningless and futile and or a lot of labour for nothing, be a Christian. Because God's purposes are eternal and what he accomplishes in you and through you and for you lasts forever. That's why he says, store up your treasure in heaven, remember, where, rot, where rust and moths can't get at it and no one can steal it. So it's eternal reward, not just a temporal, you know, a short-term here reward that you have and then it's gone. You know? I used to compete in sport and I usually would win in my sport. I had lots of trophies. But I can't even remember I can't even remember them. I don't even know where the trophies are. You know? Those kind of achievements and rewards they just they only last for a moment and then they're gone. You know? That's it. That's a reality. So you have this tension, this tug of war, everyone does, between God dragging you by his spirit toward Jesus into the gospel, into discipleship, and your own fallen nature, trying to pull back the opposite direction. Why would you fight God? Right? But he gave us free will, and so it's just the reality is we are not smart enough to not fight him for, until you mature in your faith. You, you know, people will go on thinking that, you know, God doesn't really understand me. If only God knew what it was like to be me, etc., etc. We cover that as well, remember. There's nothing he doesn't see, nothing he doesn't hear, and therefore nothing he doesn't know in fact he knows before you know it takes time to mature until we can really understand that so i want to what i want to look at here is in this tug of war is there a limitation is there a point at which the spirit will no longer try and pull someone to salvation can you get to a place where it's just too far gone, you know? So turn with me to uh, Genesis 24, verse 2. And you'll, this is also a revision, but remember, we've been here a few times. This is where Abraham, he's quite old, right? Isaac, his son, doesn't have a wife. So he doesn't send his son to get a, a bride. He sends his servant his oldest servant. Let's read and, and then we'll explain it. So Genesis 24 verse 2. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, place your hand under my thigh and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites amongst whom I live. So just to explain that quickly, he made the servant promise, don't even look amongst the pagans. My, the bride for my son must be holy. Paul gives the same advice. He says, do not be unevenly yoked. If you're a Christian girl, unless you particularly want a miserable life, don't marry an unsaved guy. If you're a Christian guy, it's slightly because of headship, it's slightly less terrible, but not much. It's still terrible. Short answer is, if a Christian marries a non-Christian, it's a terrible time that they're in for. There will be a, a power struggle spiritually constantly, and you'll be miserable. Don't do it. Doesn't matter how good looking the guy is, doesn't matter how cool he is, if he's not saved, don't even think about it. Unless you're crazy. Anyhow, that's what that's about. 
now where do we get to but you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac and the servant said to him this is the important thing suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land should I take your son back to the land where you came from so if the woman's not willing to come he says should I go and get Isaac and take him there right then Abraham said to him Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel messenger before you, and you will take a wife from my son from there. But if the woman, listen carefully, but if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this my oath. So this servant, he prefigures, he typifies Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them to me. It's the same order. The Father wants a bride. The Father chooses the girl. He sends his servant, the Holy Spirit, to get her. He doesn't send his son. It, salvation starts with God. You know, salvation by grace? Grace charis, right? A gift. So it, it, it starts by the will of God, not your will. You don't decide to think, I think I'll be a Christian. Never happens. If you're thinking that, God already thought it. If you're at that point where even contemplating Jesus, it, he's already drawing you, right? God, the Father, is the one who wants a bride for his son. He doesn't send the son, he sends the servant who, to represent him and the interests of his son. That's the Holy Spirit. And he starts to draw the person to Jesus. Has that person seen Jesus? No. No. He hasn't. And we see, I think I, actually, let me just check. I think I covered this. Did I? Did I? Maybe not. Anyway, let's, I will tell you, and if I end up doubling up, that's okay. So, Rebecca, Rivka, her Hebrew name, she's never seen Isaac. When the servant reaches the land, there are a lot of girls. He has no idea. <laughs> No idea. So he prays and he asks God to give him a sign. Which one is it? So God gives him a sign. So he believes God. So it's God the Father choosing, right? The Holy Spirit goes to her and said, I'm on a mission. I've been sent to get a wife for my master's son, Isaac, who you've never met, you've never seen, but let me tell you about him. So he tells her about Isaac. It's all in Genesis 24 if you want to read it. And her family's sitting listening, right? So the bottom line is, under the conviction of God, she ultimately agrees to come with the servant to go back and marry Isaac, even though she's never met him. That's exactly what happens with every person who's saved. You've not seen Jesus face to face. You've not met him. You barely know anything about him. And yet you're called into a betrothal engagement to be married. A serious contract. A, a full-on heavy-duty relationship that ends in permanent marriage from which there's no divorce. That doesn't happen till the wedding of the Lamb right at the end. But remember the servant's question? What if she says no? Abraham said, if she says no, you are released from your vow. You don't have to bring her back. Even Rebecca's father, he announces, this is, as far as he's concerned, this is clearly from God, that God is the author of it. But even in that case, my daughter has to agree herself. He will not order his daughter to go. He asks her, are you willing to go? Is it your will? 
to go with the servant back to your actually it's a relative Isaac and marry him even though you've never met him just on the strength of what the servant has said and she says yes it's her free will choice the limitation on that servant is the same limitation on the Holy Spirit even though God is sovereign even though he could make you he could force people to be saved he could fill up heaven with people who did not actually themselves choose to be there how do you think that would work out right so he doesn't so the fact that he he leaves the choice to the person is no weakness in God it's nothing to do with any sort of weakness in Jesus it's not a limitation of power in the Holy Spirit he could make them it's a volitional choice of God not to he wants those who want to be there when people say who goes to heaven to me when they ask me the question who goes to heaven I always give them the same answer those who want to be there who want to be there so much they're willing to do what God says is necessary in order to attain it but they have to want it they have to actually want to be saved they have to want to be they have to want eternal life they have to want their sins forgiven they have to want to be reconciled with God and if they don't they won't end up doing any of the things necessary to actually attain that I'm talking about half the church probably if not more anyhow what that limitation is that so even if let's just say you're the one that God is using to bring the gospel you are the human part of the sending the servant and the Holy Spirit is there present drawing the person so let's just for the sake of our argument say that all the conditions are perfect everything is how it ought to be and God has given you the right things to say and pointed you to the right scriptures and you've shared it faithfully and you've done everything well and the Holy Spirit of course always done every always does everything well and he's really drawing and then you get to that point where the bride male or female remember when it comes to the bride of Christ it means all of us male and female so whether it's a guy or a girl it makes no difference can you make them be saved can can we save them can we force them to be saved is there anything we can do to drag them kicking and screaming in handcuffs to heaven no why because it's God's rule we present all they need to know we open their eyes we take away ignorance the Holy Spirit's doing his part but it all comes down to free will do you want Jesus of Nazareth you can have done everything perfectly and they say no and they mean no it's really really hard on Christians who by this stage will be full of the love and compassion of Christ for that person and desperate that they not go to hell and then the person says well no thanks you know because I like uh, I like sin I like what I do I like my life why should I get why should I give that up you know it's so important for us to really own the same limitation that's on that servant in the story we are on oath we are under oath if you think you haven't got that servant's oath if you're a disciple you already agreed it's the Great Commission you know go and make disciples of the whole earth 
give them the gospel, make disciples. It's the same oath. Go and get me a bride for my son. It's exactly the same thing, right? What if, what if they refuse to come? It's the same thing. Well, if you've done your part, if you've done what I asked, and if the Holy Spirit's done what God sends him to do, and he does, and they say no, you are released from that obligation in the same way as the as um, Abraham's servant was released. The obligation ends. I'll talk more about that in just a second. I'm trying to, I wrote quite a few notes because I was in a hurry and it ended up being eight pages, so I'm not going to do every single page. Blow by blow, you can read the written copy after. It's on email. If you, if you want it on email and you don't presently get it, message me your email address and we'll add you so when you're giving the gospel when you're sharing you must be very careful for your own mental health and your own spiritual health not to go beyond the limit God has set you are not the Messiah I've seen a lot of people burn themselves out and go nearly crazy because they genuinely, desperately want a certain person to be saved, or a certain group to be saved, or whatever. But they just keep saying no, and then they start to take it personally, as if, well, it must be me. I must be, you know, what, what have I missed? What have I not done? Sometimes you've missed nothing, and there's nothing you haven't done. If they say no, and last week you'll remember, even when Jesus came in person he did all those miracles in front of thousands he fed thousands miraculously he healed the sick he raised the dead <laughs> you know he gave them the perfect gospel and he gave them the f perfect demonstration of Messiah because he is the Messiah right where was he lacking nowhere what did he forget to do? Nothing. What did he forget to say? Nothing. Was the Holy Spirit on holiday? No. How do you think the miracles happen? Well, why then are there so few disciples? Remember last week I said that the number of disciples peaks in the middle of the story and then most of them, most of them turn back. Most of them who are following him in the middle of the story are not following him at the end. It's only a remnant. And that foreshadows what happens in the church it's before the second coming. Jesus says the love of most will grow cold because of the increase of wickedness. Most of the church will do exactly what the, those following him did when he was here in person. When it gets hard, most of them will turn back. They will stop following. They will cease to be his disciples we're seeing that already right so if it's like that for the real messiah and you're not the messiah and neither am i so if it's like that when he's here in person do not beat yourself up when it happens to you if it happened to him if you understand this limitation that god is by his own choice has allowed free will to be the last say so to speak no matter that it hurts you will weep you will cry God is weeping and crying Jesus is weeping and crying right over the loss of that person you are feeling his pain that they said no but it's still no they choose they bring that upon themselves by their free will you are not responsible for what happens to them after that. God releases you from your oath concerning them. So you are no longer under obligation. Obligation meaning you'll be held to account. What do you need? What do you need then to care about? Well, the only time you need to be concerned is if you ignore your obligation when you know you were supposed to have said something 
and you didn't. Now you're in trouble. You know, but if you did your part and they said, no, go away, I don't want to hear about it, you're released from the obligation, right? Their obligation is to do the bit that's ours. There's a saying, I don't know if it's also in the Philippines or if this makes any sense, but it's a Kiwi saying, that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You know, if you know a horse needs to drink water, you can lead it by a bridle. You can lead it to the trough and show it the water, but you can't force it to drink. Just try it and see what happens, right? <laughs> you can't. Evangelism's the same. So, in an age where there's more people falling away than coming, because that's fulfillment of prophecy, right? I'm emphasizing this so that you will not be dismayed when it happens to you, when you've done everything right, and they still say no. Well, why wouldn't God just force them? If he loves them so much he wants everyone to be saved, why wouldn't he force them? Everything in the Bible tells you something about God's character, right? So this next bit might surprise you a bit, but please turn to Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19. In verse 13, this reflects something about our Father, God, and Jesus as the intending husband. A foolish child is a father's ruin, and a quarrelsome wife is like the constant dripping of a leaky roof. And there's a whole lot of others about difficult, quarrelsome, argumentative, or rebellious wives. All of them, you know, if you're a feminist, you'd be up in arms saying, oh, how dare God say that, you know, Christianity is so archaic and male-dominated, blah, blah, blah. It's complete nonsense, all right? Because by now you should know that whilst, yes, this can apply to an actual woman, it primarily is pointing to the church. Everything God says here about the, the, the kind of wife that's a pain in the neck to him is talking about the kind of church, the kind of bride for his son that is a nightmare to him. What kind of children does he want? Well, not ones who continually foolish, they bring ruin on their father's house. The father's house here in that he's pointing to primarily is the church, the house of God. When the when his children are, are foolish and don't listen and go their own way, it brings ruin on that house and discredit to his name until the unsaved look at it and shake their heads and say, who'd want to be a Christian? Look at that. Like we see happening with Arise and Hillsong and many others. That's why free will is in the equation. He doesn't want an argumentative wife. He wants a wife that wants to be the wife. He doesn't want children who still want to go their own way. They just, they just destroy the place. He made a way, that's why it's narrow, he made a way for those who want to be the bride who want to be saved, who want to be holy, who want eternal life and everything that comes with it. They want reconciliation with God. They don't want to belong to the world anymore. They want to cross that wilderness, which is this life as a Christian, being transformed, being made a new creation, so they can enter that narrow gate at the end. And that's what motivates them so they seek to be wise, to live wisely, to live not like the argumentative... Remember I said about this tug of war between your will and God's will? Not the quarrelsome wife who's like, you know, water constantly dripping through a leaky roof slowly drives you crazy, right? That's not the eternal wife God is looking for. That's what we are now. <laughs> That's what his people are. 
when they're rebellious. That's what he's saving us from. He's sa he's trying to save us from being the quarrelsome wife that he doesn't want. Instead of just getting rid of us altogether, he makes a way for us to be changed. Changed. So free will has to be in there. Jesus wants the bride forever who wanted to be there. He wanted to be his bride on his terms, his agenda, you know, his character. They wanted to be with him. So, just look at my notes. Just one other aspect I want, sorry, I keep hitting my laptop, which will have you all shaking. So, um, I've listed through, maybe I'll just read this list. So the first thing that comes out of all this, number one, is about responsibility. Where do the responsibilities lie? Ours is to give the invitation. Theirs is to make the free will choice. The responsibility for the consequences of that choice is theirs, not yours. Make sure that you don't go beyond what is the limit even of the Holy Spirit and God's order and plan. Free will, remember, the bride has to agree. Being, so, we're not responsible for, if they say no, we will weep. God is weeping as well. But that doesn't mean that we have failed. You look yourself in the mirror, have you done what God asks? If the answer is yes, that's it. If it's no, go and fill in whatever you haven't done. You know? But if you do everything and there's just nothing left to do and they still say no, it's really on their own heads. As sad as that will make you, you're not actually going to be held to account for it. Right? At all. You did what he asked of you. That's what Christian success is, by the way. Success is that you do what he asked. Not that you see what you hope will happen as a result. Whether that happens or not, success, in God's eyes, is that his servant went and did what he asked him to do. And this is a very important example of that. So if you do what he asks and they say no, you're still a success in God's eyes. You successfully did what he sent you to do you're not responsible for what they did with it, okay? If I sound like I'm repeating, and I am repeating, it's because I've seen the devastating consequences when people get this wrong. So make sure you really own it, okay? Last one. If they say no and you're released from the obligation, does this mean you just walk away? No. Obligation means you are obliged to do something. You have free will as well. So maybe not straight away, but at some point you can yourself of free will try again. You know, you've met your obligation. You did what God asked and they said no. But if of your free will, you want to try again at different times and just persevere and persist. Now, you're not being motivated by because it's your duty. Now you're being motivated because you care. Now, you, now it's love that's motivating you, love for him. When you weep with him, when you realize how sad and how much pain it causes Jesus who hung on a cross for that person and they don't want him. You know, very often your desire to reduce the pain that Jesus is feeling for that person will have you realize how stupid they're being and feel compassion for them, thinking, oh, you know, you don't understand, do you? So love will send you back 
to try again but it's no longer about obligation right now it's your free will it's very much easier at that time because you know you can you have no responsibility at all for their choice at that point and you're exercising your free will to keep the offer open knowing that if they return to him he will return to them it's a scriptural promise for me god is always seeking their repentance so if they say no a hundred times but on the hundred and first time they say yes if who cares about the hundred times before right but it's no longer about obligation at that point now you're motivated by love so don't make the mistake that thinking just because your obligation is cancelled that therefore you can't go again yes you can but no longer because you have to now because you want to okay and there's many people have been saved who said no a thousand times to a hundred people until the penny dropped you know where everything lined up for them and then they suddenly realize that people have been telling them the truth the whole time and they get saved at last right so the only thing as I said that you really don't want to be guilty of is refusing to go when you know God's saying go and talk to that person when you stay silent when you know you're supposed to be sharing you know do you know that shyness is selfishness saying I'm too scared that's selfishness right everyone's shy everyone's scared but when you're telling the truth you don't have to justify it you just tell the truth because it's the truth you don't have to be scared about what they'll say even if they just laugh you don't have to be scared about that either because when you're telling the truth it, it vindicates you it validates you in and of itself you tell it because it's the truth whether they listen or not then your conscience your own conscience is clear then if you want to feel really bad about yourself just lie just make something up to avoid having to tell them the truth then you'll feel lousy for forever right so don't be shy and don't be scared of telling them what the scripture actually says with that same limitation if they won't listen that's on them your job is just to bring the message bring the offer now we talked about we talked about the quarrelsome wife and how God describes her as a nightmare basically why would you want her in your house right and that's really God's attitude what does the quarrelsome wife look like because remember although of course there's an application for actual women actual wives but really that's not primarily why it's in the scripture God is pointing to his attitude about the wife the church right so what does the quarrelsome church look like what are the foolish children that ruin his house look like well every time you have a church that reduces God from his proper proper place as the husband the head over the woman remember the church is the woman when they are when they refuse to let Jesus be the head he's the Word of God so they refuse to give the priority to the word and they bring their own agenda and what they want and they demand and argue and claim and claim in Jesus name and argue and carry on with God why he has to give them what they want 
even though nine times out of ten what they want is the opposite of what God wants. Things going on in the church now to do with, you know, sexual identity and sexual morality and all these things, right? Shaking their fist at, this is church people, shaking their fist at Jesus saying, you have to agree with us because we want it like this and we want it like that. This is the quarrelsome wife. They go on and on and on until Jesus has just has a giant headache because they will not acknowledge him as the husband. They want to wear the pants. This is dominionism. This is where Jesus is reduced to the family butler or a vending machine where they want him to do their will in his name <laughs> as if as if Jesus didn't know any better and isn't he lucky to have a, a wife like this who can wear the pants and make all the decisions and tell him what needs to happen. If you don't think church is like that, I, I don't know where you've been because I've visited endless churches that are exactly like this. You know, exactly like this. They pay no attention to his actual character and they demand he does things that that he cannot because it's so contrary to his character the quarrelsome wife what are the foolish children well it's the same thing right foolish and rebellious children it's supposed to be the children of god but actually they don't humble themselves to listen to him about anything they don't respect his law they don't respect his morals they don't respect his decrees his commands they pay lip service to it all they want the benefit of being christian but they don't want to humble themselves and acknowledge him as king and obey you know they'll talk about his sovereignty if if their enemies are hassling him and they want God to go and stomp on them, then they'll happily go on about how God is sovereign over our enemies and he can destroy them and he can save us from them and all the rest. But if if it's about them needing to humble themselves and obey, suddenly is silence about his sovereignty. <laughs> you know, I'm laughing. I shouldn't laugh because it's tragic. It's just so stupid. But it's most of the church is like this so we mustn't be like that we must not be the stupid children who end up destroying god's house as you're seeing happening with hillsong as you're seeing happening with arise here and many many other places the whole southern baptist convention in the states is imploding at the moment all the problems across the whole of Christendom because God has had enough and he's doing exactly what he said he would do he's lifting up their skirts and exposing them naked for the nations the unsaved to see God is basically saying not me I'm not in this this is a fake look at it you know he's exposing them for what they are to clear his name of association with them so that those he still wants to save can flee out of those things coming maybe for the first time to him in the proper way and actually being saved so the foolish kids wrecked the house those churches are ruined and the quarrelsome wife drives the husband away Jesus God will give them up because they refuse to humble themselves and submit to his headship you know because remember you might say well God can't divorce them we're the bride of Christ no one we're betrothed remember yes once the wedding supper of the lamb has happened that happens after the rapture right so then there's no divorce then it's permanent but until then, we're only betrothed. And in God's law, a betrothal can be cancelled. Cancelled. Right? So, these people might have at some point 
intended to be disciples, but now they want to wear the pants in the relationship. He can cancel the betrothal. It's only room for one husband in God's, in the, in the wedding of Jesus, there's only room for one husband, and it's him, not us. The quarrelsome wife. So you then might say, well, what kind of wife does he want then? And you find her one psalm back in Psalm 18. Here he talks about the perfect woman, right? I don't know if I've ever met her apart from my wife, of course. But this is how God describes the perfect woman and ladies Bible study. You might want to take a note of this. This is a great study um, for women with this caveat that understanding is really talking about the church. So although this is a this is a tells us a lot about what Christian women should be like of even heavier importance is this is what the good wife of Jesus should be like. So whether you're male or female, these are goals for us as members of the body because we're all the bride. So this isn't a sexist thing, right? Actually, this applies to all of us, male and female, if we are part of the bride-to-be. This is the wife God applauds. Let's read about here. We're not going to do talk about each line by line because that would be an entire bowl study all by itself. But by the time we get to the bottom here, you'll have the idea well enough and you can do some study yourself if you want to. And again, women's study group, it might be a good one for you. So Psalm 18 verse 10. A wife of noble character who can find, so rare, right? Remember, the, the way is narrow, not many find it. The wife of noble character who can find she is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. So, think of, he's talking about the church. Her lamp, because of she labours so diligently for the good of her husband's household. Who's her husband's house? Who's her husband? Jesus. Who's what's his household? The body of Christ. She labours for for that. She's diligent, right? And therefore, her lamp does not go out at night. Remember the parable of the five wise and the five un unwise virgins. It's a direct correlation with that. Anyhow. Verse 19, her, in her hand she holds the distaff. Now, you won't know what a distaff is, but if you've ever seen people spinning wool into yarn, the wool that's just off the, the sheep that's been combed out so it's loose, that's what's going into the, into the wheel and getting spun into yarn, right? So to hold that loose wool, you have a stick. And it's just pushed on. And so you're turning the stick and that wool is coming off and going into the into the um, spinning wheel. That stick is the distaff, okay? Technical term. I'm from a sheep family, so I know. But in her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. So... This is talking about weaving now. So she is in control of taking something and making it into something more valuable. That's what that's really talking about. 
She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Purple here represents royalty, by the way. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes a seat amongst the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Remember we're talking about the church. She's, she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. Roa, if you're watching, this is one you all know. Verse 30. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honour her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So again, the feminists would probably look at that and say, oh, that's very demeaning a woman, and it makes it sound like she's a slave, of, you know, her husband's slave, and blah, blah, blah. You have to understand this through Hebrew eyes, of course. If you go back and read it carefully, this woman is not oppressed. This woman is not a slave. Her husband trusts her with the whole, with everything. She's got the money. She's buying the land. She's investing. She is running the house. You know, she's a woman with wisdom and sound counsel. You know, her husband is proud of her. He's not, you know, a lazy so-and-so. The fact that you don't hear what he's doing is because this passage is not about him. You know, the husband hears Jesus. He's busy. You know, he, he's got his own burden doing what God has called him to do. But the household, the children, the well-being of the servants, the well-being of the poor, you know, taking something and making more of it, etc., etc., controlling the money, all these things. Who is entrusted with that? The good wife. She's not a mouse. She's a lion. <laughs> you know? But she loves her husband, and she's dedicated to his cause. And she loves what is his, and she's dedicated to looking after it, including the children. So you can learn, if you're a woman, you can learn things from that in, in that context if you wish. But male and female, all of us, that's the, that's the good wife according to God. Not just according to me, according to God. That's, what, that's the kind of wife he's seeking for his son. It's Rebecca, Rivka, right? When you read it as meaning, when you read it in the context of talking about the, the kind of church, the kind of bride that he's seeking, the one he wants to stay with, not the quarrelsome one who becomes like a dripping, you know, like a leaky roof dripping on his head, slowly driving him insane while the children destroy the house. <laughs> We're talking about eternity here, right? The contrast could not be greater. Learn from this. Understand, he is the head. He's looking for the bride who's willing, free will, remember, to humble herself and be like that as a body, as a church, as the bride of Christ to be. Such a contrast in modern churches, I can tell you. 
Let's learn from it. Let's learn from it. So, let's look at my notes. So I've asked here, why doesn't God seem to draw some people and why does he draw some people for a time and then he stops? Ultimately, it's a sovereign choice. Genesis, he says, I will bless whom I will bless and I will curse whom I will curse, right? None of us deserve it, remember. All have sinned, all have fallen short. So if you're talking about rights or anything like that, the only thing we have a right to expect is hell for our rebellion, our sin, and what we've done already, right? So forget about rights, nothing to do with rights. So in his grace and in his foreknowledge, remember we did this a few weeks ago, that because he's outside of time, he doesn't just hear and see and understand everything happening now. He hears and sees and understands everything happening ever. Just as he already knew Judas would betray him. Why? Because he'd already seen it from outside of time before he came to earth, right? He foreknew that that would happen. And it needed to happen to fulfill scripture. That's why he chose him, right? So, we have to trust that God, who knows the thought and intent of the heart, he knows, you know the parable of the sower, right? He knows what's in a man, whether it's good soil that the word of God can grow up in and bear fruit, or a heart that's so hard, like rock, that nothing will penetrate it, like Caiaphas the high priest, even when God is talking to Caiaphas face to face in the person of his son, Jesus. Does anything penetrate Caiaphas's rock-hard heart? No. So he perishes. Does Jesus still give him the gospel? Yes. Remember that was our lesson, which I repeat now. One standard. Remember, with the measure you use, will be measured to you. So what measure should you use? Well, the one Jesus uses. Christ-likeness. We have to have a measure. You can't be inert. We have to relate. But he says, pick one. Because the one that you pick, that's the one that will be applied to you by God. Not by people. Did I mention that before? In case I didn't. With the measure you use, it'll be measured to you, means from God, not from other people. Make sure you understand that. So if you are loving and merciful and kind to a whole lot of people who are wolves in sheep's clothing, they will not, they, they will not be loving, merciful and kind back to you. They will be what their nature dictates. Wolves, they'll rip you to pieces, right? But God will deal you with you in with mercy and kindness and rescue. So when he says measured to you, he means by him, not by the people. Don't make that mistake. As you give, so you will receive is also from him, not people. People get really hurt that, oh, but I did this, I did everything for them, and how can, they, how can they do that to me? Thinking, wrongly, that that scripture is some sort of magic spell, that if I'm nice to you, you'll have to be nice to me. And then they get really hurt when the person is not nice to them, just the reverse. Understand both of those scriptures, that God is, Jesus is talking about himself. So as you treat others, I will treat you. Jesus talking, right? So you you can have a terrible time at the hands of people who don't return your kindness, just the opposite, or abuse you or take you for granted or all the things that happen. But that's not what he means. He's talking about how he will treat you. You know, how he will treat you. So you may get terribly wounded by the people, but now they're in serious trouble with God because how you treat God's servants is how you treat God so if you are so if you're really God's servant in the situation and they reject you and beat you and do all that to you that reflects their real attitude towards Jesus so they are in the world of hurt already for that right that's why we're able to pray for them 
feeling sorry for them instead of afraid when you realize that you'll never be afraid of them or even angry with them because you'll just realize that they're dangling over hell right now on a very thin rope it's easy to feel sorry for them and pray for them instead right so back to where, what we were saying because we're called to just have this one standard like Jesus who gave the same gospel to Caiaphas and the Pharisees that he gave to his own disciples he wasn't he didn't have two standards he's not double-minded one measure no gospel one measure Christ likeness you know well he didn't have to try and be Christ like he is Christ right so but he's our role model that's what love that's lo what love your enemies means in practice don't just love those who love you. Don't have one standard for the one way of operating for the people that love you and a different way for the people that don't. One way. Christ-likeness to those who love you back and Christ-likeness to those who don't. Why? Because Christ-likeness, understand this, Christ-likeness is the right way. That's enough reason all by itself. So again similar to what we were talking about at the beginning of this how someone responds to you in their free will should not even enter into the decision about what you do you do it because it's right you adopt that measure Christ likeness because it is the right way even if they don't do it back it's the same as when you share the gospel even if they don't even if they say no does that mean you shouldn't have shared it? No, you should share it because sharing it is right. That's what we're called to do. We do it because that's what he asked. We do it because it's right. That's all the reason we need. Whether they listen or not, I should be merciful whether they are merciful back or not. Why? Because merciful is right. You know? I should care about people who don't care about me. I get this a lot. People say, why are you so committed to people in another country who can't ever do anything for you? What a stupid question. <laughs> you know? Because Christ in me cares about them. Why would I take a different view? You know, I'm just agreeing with my husband, Jesus, you know, I'm just, I'm, I want to be the good wife. It even said it there, you know, that we read in the psalm. You do it because it's right, not because of what they can do, can't do, might do. It's irrelevant, completely irrelevant. The world is selfish. So the world decides who it's going to be nice to based on what it thinks they that being nice will win, get them back. You know? Well, that's crooked and corrupt. That's like some kind of con job. You know? That the whole time you're motivated by what you hope you can get back out of it. If that's your motivation, just give up now. <laughs> There's no reward in heaven for that, right? We should give without expecting anything back. Why? Well, because giving is right. We should help those who can't help themselves. Why? Well, because doing that is right in God's eyes. Whatever Jesus would do, that's what's right. Whatever he said to do, that's what's right. Whatever he instructed his disciples to do, that's what's right. That's why we do it. Whether anyone responds in kind, whether anyone agrees, whether the, even if the whole church, as is happening before our eyes, goes completely bonkers and starts preaching things totally opposite to the Bible, that's on their heads. We should not change our behaviour at all by what people, by what the foolish children or the quarrelsome wife jumps up and down and demands. We want to be the good wife. So we do what our husband asked. 
Jesus. We're the bride of Christ, remember? So as a body, the bride, to be, we're supposed to be making ourselves ready for the wedding, learning what pleases him doing that. Why? Because it pleases him. Finding out about the family business. You know, that good wife is described as running the whole household. In Jewish society, even if they had a business, Joseph's carpentry business, who do you think runs it? Mary. For sure. You know? He does the work. She runs it. Does the, you know, keeps the money and all that stuff. The Jewish society is like that, even now. Right? So... Yeah, so Christian women are not are meant to be, to be equal, but in a different role. And your husband is equal, but in a different role. None of this is about being, you know, an oppressed little mouse or a slave, like some people imagine. don't know how I suddenly got talking about that, but anyway, just for clarity, let's go on. So, we come to a question. Since we can't, we can't make anyone say yes. Remember I said we can't go beyond what even, the, even is a limitation of the Holy Spirit by choice. Even though God is absolutely sovereign and he could make us. He chooses not to. He wants it to be a free will choice. So that's the limitation he he places. And we can't go beyond it, right? So the question comes up, what about something he's promised in which free will could theoretically stop it happening? How does the sovereignty of God deal with when it collides head first with the stubbornness and the pride and the hard-heartedness of someone who keeps saying no where God has promised to save them. So this applies to some individuals that God has made specific promises to to somebody, different individuals. But of course, scripturally, it applies most of all and, and because it applies in scripture, of course it applies to people living today, individuals in this situation, who are like who? Like Jacob. Remember, God calls Israel Jacob when he's stubborn, when he's the quarrelsome wife. Remember, Jacob wrestled with God all night. He quarreled with God for his own way. Stubborn, fighting, <laughs> not humbled <laughs> he wrestled with God the whole night all through the night right how did God get to a point where he could bless him he had to overcome him he had to break him in his strongest place remember remember he touches his hip his, God touches his hip with his finger and he he's crippled and ever after walks with a limp so God took his strength away in a place where, in his own nature, you know, as a human, he was strongest. We all understand that. But we know from the scripture, or you certainly you should do, if you've been around me, that when Jesus comes back, it's to do with the time of Jacob's trouble. And to understand it a bit more, you think it's Jacob's trouble, not Israel's trouble trouble so we're talking about unsaved Jews who have hardened their hearts like stone against Jesus those who haven't hardened their hearts have already gone in the rapture so every Jew that Jesus could reach by drawing them by his spirit and there's many remember Messianic Jews so whether Jew or Gentile if he could get to your heart drawing you you're already gone in the rapture. So the only people left that he has a covenant promise to save, but who are so hard-hearted, so blind, blinded by the rabbis, so stubborn, 
like a mule that <laughs> like a donkey that the normal thing cannot reach them no matter what an evangelist says it doesn't matter what happens they just won't repent and the book of revelation tells us this as all the cups of uh, sorry the bowls of god's wrath have been poured out it says that the people shook their fist at god and still did not repent so even when you know the world is doing the whole hollywood end of days thing you think surely surely hmm. so we read about this how does God keep his promise to save Jacob? You know, he's promised through the prophets that he was he promised the patriarchs to save a remnant of Jacob, that Messiah would come and save them. And when he came, eternal peace would return to Jerusalem and they would never be overcome again, right? So this is the end of days. And when it says all Israel will be saved, it's because once they repent, he doesn't call them Jacob anymore, he calls them Israel. So, not all Jacob will be saved, all Israel will be saved. Only those that repent of Jacob will be saved, Israel. How can God still leave it to free will? Because remember, he's not double-minded. He's only got one, one way of dealing, right? How can he take a people? who are so hard-hearted, so unbelievably stubborn, so sure that they are right, the quarrelsome wife. <laughs> and how can he save them if their free will has to have the last say? Remember, he won't force anyone to be saved. Well, we find out in Zechariah, right so it's in Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 13 which and it, when you read it it sounds like it's back to front in order but it's just the way Zechariah is written okay so all these things happen sort of concurrently so let's read Zechariah 12 first just because it comes first in the Bible okay actually you read it but you know this very well because it's quoted in the New Testament it says that they will look upon the one they have pierced and weep as one weeps for an only son. So this is a Hebrew way. When you weep for the death of your only son, it's a way of saying that your family name, you're weeping because your family name has ended. Because if your only son who carries your name dies and you have no more sons and you're the last, you know, everyone's only son is dead it's a hebrew way of saying that you're about to be extinct that your generations are about to end so it's a very hebrew way of saying they're weeping because they're facing extinction complete annihilation total extinction as a people no more jews at all that's what they're facing and they look upon the one they have pierced. Who's that? Jesus. That's why it's quoted in the New Testament. Right? Because he realizes, when he, as he's quoting it, he realizes that he's witnessing the piercing that the people who will fulfill that scripture will realize they are responsible for. Why are they responsible? Because he came to save them. He, he bore those wounds and g gave his life and shed his blood for their salvation as much as for yours and mine, right? So, why are they weeping? Why do they think they're going to be extinct? Well, we find this in uh, Zechariah 13, the very next chapter. And like I say, it's why... It's, it seems a bit confusing as if one thing happens and then the other, but actually it's all happening together. It's just the way the chapter divisions are put in the book. Because remember in the original there's no chapters. So in verse 8 of Zechariah 13, 
he says, in the whole land, is in what the land that we call Israel, in the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. So two-thirds of all the Jews left in the world who, did, who had not already accepted Jesus and been raptured, they're going to die, and die horribly, because they refuse to bow to Jesus. Their free will was their own destruction. This has already been foreshadowed. In the Holocaust, the famous Holocaust at the hands of the Nazis in World War II, the same ratio, approximately two-thirds of all the Jews in Europe, remember the World War II is happening in Europe, the German part is happening in Europe, right? So the same ratio, approximately two-thirds of all Jews alive at that time in Europe died in the Holocaust, something over six million of them died. Only a third did not die, and most of those God bought out and sent them where? To what had been um, British Palestine and became the land of Israel that we know today. So the same, So he's had a practice run, if you like. And we think of the Holocaust, what happened in Auschwitz and places like that, at the hands of the Nazis, trying to exterminate the Jewish people. That's nothing compared to what's coming. Nothing. That will be like a happy day compared to what's coming. As Zechariah says, two-thirds of all of them will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third, verse 9, this third I will put into the fire. So it's not like they escape easily. This third I will put into the fire, that's trial. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. Well, if you've ever seen how they refine silver and gold, they grind it, they beat it, they smash it, they stick it in the blast furnace, until the impurity lets go of the pure. So that what you want to keep, the gold or the silver, separates from what's impure. Now you call it refined. So you might think, oh well, one third of, well, they'll be just comfortable and somehow miraculously safe. Uh uh. No. They might even be jealous of those who are dead. Such will be the refining. How do we know that? Because this is Jacob, whose heart is as hard as granite, whose stubbornness against the idea of Jesus is like a bank vault. <laughs> you know? The word, the truth, virtually can't get in. But God has a promise to keep, and he can only keep it if they make a free will choice. So what does he do? He puts all of them, the whole lot, into a situation that's so, so extreme. How extreme? Turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 15. Jesus explains it. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, Spoken of through the prophet Daniel, if you want to read that, it's Daniel 9 verse 27. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Now verse 21, the critical thing. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. This means that the time of Jacob's trouble, which Jesus is talking about, that the Jews already knew from from Jeremiah and from Daniel must take place. Jesus is saying that the experience will be literally the worst thing to ever happen in human history. We will never have any equal before it or after it. 
So even the third who are saved will be so crushed. When we say they're saved, it's just like they just barely managed to not die. Two thirds die. Two thirds don't make it. This it destroys them. They were dead already, remember. God's not killing them. They're already dead in sin. So in order to save the third, he puts the whole lot into this experience, which, according to God himself, re confirmed by Jesus, will be the worst experience any human ever has on earth. Bar none. It'll make the Holocaust of World War II seem like a birthday party. Nothing before it or after it will ever be as terrifying, as appalling, as crushing. So crushing, it's like getting silver and gold out of the rock. Even the hardest heart will do one of two things. Explode and die, or break. The one third are the hard, stubborn hearts that under this much pressure, this is the length, the extreme that God goes to to save them. Why? Because their choice has to be free will. So he won't force them to be saved but he forces them in their stubbornness and rebellion and refusal to listen to a place <laughs> where even they can't stay in the delusion. Where even they can't deny Jesus anymore, which is why they finally look upon... It says that God sends a spirit, the latter rain, that he pours out his spirit on them their eyes are open, and in that state of absolute distress when it's so bad they are convinced that the whole Jewish people was about to become extinct, you know, weeping as one weeps for an only son, only then can God then try drawing them again, and this time they see, only when they're that smashed, that crushed, that broken, that humbled, that lowered that their pride and arrogance has turned to dust and blown away, that their stubbornness has just vaporized because they, don't, they have no strength to breathe. Only then do they finally listen, do they finally look, and that's when they weep for Jesus who they crucified. And what does God do? He forgives them. He stops calling them Jacob. He calls them Israel. And he redeems them. He applies the blood of Jesus to their account and cancels their sin. And that's what triggers the second coming. Because at that time Jerusalem is completely surrounded by the armies of Antichrist who have gathered together for the final assault on Jerusalem that is going to kill that one third that's still left, that's holed up in there. And they can't do anything about it. You know, it's curtains, it's certain doom. And where is that army gathering to destroy them? On the plains, in the Valley of Jezreel, the Valley of Decision, which is under a mountain. It's really, you and I'd call it a hill, but in Israel it's a mountain, right? A mountain called uh, Megiddo. So in Hebrew, it's Ha Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo. Armageddon gives you the word in English, Armageddon. So this army gathering at the foot of Armageddon, ready for the final push to destroy that last third, because they repent, the skies split open, and the lion of the tribe of Judah and all the host of heaven descend from heaven and destroy that army instantly. There's not really a battle. It says that, that Antichrist's armies, the, uh, and the armies of all the nations gathered there, are destroyed by the 
brilliance of his appearing and by the breath of his mouth. It's not really a battle. It's sort of, boof, you're over. Thanks for coming. You know? And then that's when he enters Jerusalem and the rest of the things that have to happen for the restoration of the kingdom, right? But in the end, it's by free will that they confess Jesus. They call upon the name of the Lord, Hashem. But this time, they call upon him by name, Yeshua, because they look upon the one they've pierced. They know who he is. They stop denying it. So when they call upon Hashem, their name, this time they use his name. They know who the, to whom they're calling, and he comes. That's what triggers the second coming. This one third that God brings to a point where by free will, see the rule doesn't change, by free will, <laughs> they say, they stop saying no and they go, yes, yes please, yes please now before we're extinct. And he answers, and they're saved. Why do we need to know about that? Well, obviously that is specifically for the end times. By the way, the whole thing of fleeing to the mountains and everything, although there is probably some spillover application to the church, that's one scripture in the New Testament that is 100% Jewish. It says those who are in Judea. It means in Judea. Flee to the mountains from Ju in Judea. This is All this happens after the rapture, what Jesus is talking about there. So the, the church is already gone. So it doesn't primarily, this is not primarily about the church. It's about Jacob the unsaved Jews who are left that God still is under oath, his own covenant to save. But look at what he has to do to save them. So, would he do it in the church? The answer is yes. How do we know? The prophet Hosea. Everything in Hosea 2, 1 and 2, but 2 in particular, is God pointing to the time of Jacob's trouble and explaining to them through Hosea what's going to happen? Remember we talked about the, the troublesome wife? <laughs> so God's got two choices, right? The troublesome wife, he can just get rid of her and only have the good wife. Or he can have the good wife and then try something extreme to turn the troublesome wife into the good wife as well rather than just giving her up. And to teach us about that, he tells Hosea, go and get yourself an unfaithful woman, a prostitute, for a wife. Hosea's a righteous guy, right? So this is, God's asking him to love and take into his house someone who's just appalling, who won't be faithful to him, who runs off with every other guy, any, anyone who offers to give her anything she wants. Remember the... the the argumentative wife is always about what she wants, not what the husband wants. And so Hosea obeys and he marries this woman called Goma and they have children. But she is constantly off with some other guy. She's sleeping around all over the place. So to get what she wants, she'll sleep with anybody, literally, to get what she wants. And she gets it, right? So poor Hosea, a righteous man, everybody knows that his wife is a whore, a prostitute. And so for a righteous man like Hosea, it must have been hell on earth, right? This is a picture of the apostate church. Hosea stands for Jesus. Even his name means the same thing as what I told you about last week. Hosea, Hoshea means salvation. Yehoshua means God's salvation. That Yehoshua is the name of Jesus in Hebrew, right? So their name is essentially the same thing. Everything you read about Hosea here is a picture of Jesus. Goma is a picture of the apostate backslidden church, and Jacob in particular. In Hosea, it also points to the church. The time of Jacob's trouble is purely Jewish, right? Nothing to do with the church. But Hosea points to us as well, his application to us. Because 
Goma is alive and well. It's all those apostate churches. It's all the ones that Jesus is the poor husband who has this unfaithful bride who will sleep with any other god to get what it wants. You know, the church that will jump into bed with Purpose Driven or jump into bed with Rome or jump into bed with, you know, anything. The LGBTQ added 55 letters more, whatever, that whole rainbow agenda thing. To get what it wants, it will jump into bed with anything to get what it wants, not caring about the impact on the true husband, right? Totally self-centered, totally rebellious, totally indifferent to any obligation to be humble, to be the, like the good wife. So Goma isn't just a picture of Jacob. Goma is also a picture of the apostate church and apostate church people. Hosea, her husband, is a picture of Christ. Their children are a picture of people who are saved, in inverted commas, in those apostate churches. And I'll explain that these are really important people, right? So they, they came to believe going to those apostate churches, but the gospel they believed is not their gospel. They believed what was taught in that place. And so they gave their allegiance to the Jesus of that place, which is not biblical Jesus, right? It's an idol, something demonic. So they should have come to the real Jesus if, the real, if that church had been faithful to the real Jesus. But it wasn't. It's, it's running after a, what in the Hosea is referred to her lovers, right? The men that give her what she wants if she'll just sleep with them. So, look at what it says, what God says to Hosea in Hosea 2, verse 2. Hosea 2, verse 2. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and make her as bare as the day she was born. I will make certain that what he means is he will expose her for what she is completely. You know, God will. Remember, we're talking about the church and Jacob. So her, her whatever appearance she's trying to appear as, God will just strip it away and, and say, so that everyone will see what a piece of work she is, right? I will make her like a desert. I will turn her into a parched land and slay her with thirst. He'll take his spirit away completely. She'll be gasping for life. I will not show my love to her children because they are the children of adultery. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. Your true husband is God. When you worship another god, you are committing a spiritual version of adultery. If you, if you increase, if your ministry or your church has children, spiritual children, you increase, but they are the result of the of relationship with something other than Jesus, a, a false Jesus, an antichrist then those children are not God's children. They are the children of adultery. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. That's what this means. Their mother has been unfaithful. The church has been unfaithful and conceived them, made them disciples of the church, in disgrace. So God tells Isaiah, tell her, she's not mine. Your children are not mine. They're the product of your adultery, your idolatry. All right? The Hebrew word where it says, she is not my wife, gets translated as she is not my wife in your Bible, in most Bibles, because the, the Hebrew foundation is lost a bit. The word, the actual word, 
if you literally translate it, just says, she is not my woman. The word is just woman, right? The interpreters put the word, put translated as wife because she's had children with Hosea, so they assume she must be his wife, right? But when God talks about her, he says, she's not my woman, because remember, there's no divorce with God. But the betrothal is able to be cancelled. So that's really what God's saying here. And remember, Gomer's pointing to Jacob at the end, right? The Jews. And elsewhere in the scripture, God has said, I will betroth you to me forever. Betroth, become engaged to you forever. Like an, right? That is that God is your husband, and Israel is the bride to be. But here, it's not translated all that. It doesn't bring out the sense very well the way it's translated into English. So God is not giving her a divorce. He's cancelling for the time being. He's cancelling the betrothal. So this is like acknowledging that she's like a Christian who's backslidden so much that they're no longer in the covenant that the relationship they once had with Jesus is lost. They're no longer saved. They are gone. They left. Not God didn't leave. They left. And God is acknowledging it by saying, you're not my woman and your children are not my children. They were born out of your adultery, you running after a different God if you're in church, right? So... Jesus says the same thing to the Pharisees. He says, you travel over land and sea to make one disciple, only for them to turn out twice as much the sons of hell as you. Because they don't become disciples of God, they become disciples of these backslidden Pharisees. So, if, if a glacier near Christi, or if... Um, trying to think of a, another example. Let's stick with that because everyone knows that. Or the Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or whatever. If they make new disciples, are they disciples of God? No. They're disciples of that organization. What they came to believe is what the organization teaches. What they give their allegiance to is the organization. And to the Jesus of the organization none of which, in those three examples, none of which is Jesus of the Scripture. None of those, none of those Jesuses are the Son of God because what they teach is not the God, it's not the Scripture, it's not the truth, and they give to that Jesus a character and qualities and they put words in his mouth that contradict God's word. It's a different gospel. A different Jesus it's an idol idolatry is spiritual adultery their disciples are the children of adultery so what we have in our world right now is lots of churches who are in the character of Goma lots of lots of children born of those things that are disciples of those things who think they're disciples of Jesus, but they're not. God says, no, they're not my children. They're the, they're the product of adultery. So remember what Jesus says, many will come in that day saying, Lord, Lord, look at all the things we did in your name. And you say, go away, I don't know you. We don't have a relationship. These people are certainly included. They believe in a Jesus, but not Jesus. They believe in a God, but not God. They are the product, the children, of a adulterous relationship with something demonic, idolatry. So does Hosea apply to the church, even though primarily it points to a completely Jewish thing, the time of Jacob's trouble? Yes, how can we say that? Because God doesn't change. He has one measure, remember? How he deals with the Jews, he deals with the church. Just as how he dealt with the Jews 
tells us what's going to happen in the church because as for the as for the Jews so goes the church right we make all the same mistakes we follow the same pattern Paul says this he said all these things happen for our instruction so that we would understand what's happening right if you like the Jews are the crash test dummy it, it happens to them first but then it happens to us so we can say that God dealt with Goma the same God unchanging, so that's before us, the same God unchanging deals in exactly the same way as he dealt with Goma at the end, dealing with the remnant of Jacob. And we're in the middle. It's ludicrous to imagine that he won't deal with his church the same way. He's not double-minded. You know, he doesn't use a mixture of measures. He keeps his own word. He uses one measure. So as he dealt with Goma, and as he's going to deal with Jacob, he will deal with what Goma represents now in the church. And she's everywhere, and her children are everywhere. The only difference is the extremeness of it. Because remember, what happens to the Jews at the end God has specifically said that we'll never have an equal. So it won't be as bad as that, because he's already said what happens to the Jews at the end, that will be the worst example ever. You know, nothing more terrifying ever before or ever after. But it doesn't mean it won't be terrifying. It doesn't mean that it won't be, that it will be, you know, easy because, oh, but we're by grace and Jesus loves us, so, you know, he will never do anything like that, right? Well, what does God do to Goma? He cuts her off from all her lovers. He causes all her lovers to turn on her. She can't get anything she used to get. They don't they don't want to sleep with her anymore. She gets chucked out by the idols. God fences her in, he puts a hedge around her. Right? Now like an old prostitute, no one wants her. So she doesn't, she's not getting her way. She can't get her way. The ones she used to be able to wrap around her finger are avoiding her. She's in shame and her life is under so much trial. So much trial. So tested that even she breaks and she gets to a point where she says I was better off with my real husband when she confesses when she realizes that she's sinned and that she's getting what she deserves and that actually the whole time she would have been better off if she'd just been the good wife when that happens we get to chapter 3 of Hosea and this is what God says to Hosea. So remember, now you've got Hosea watching all this, feeling so ashamed of her and all the rest of it. And seeing her in this state. And she's in terrible debt because she's not getting what she usually gets from her lovers. She She's not just, like, devastated in every way. She's in massive debt, right? So in Jewish law... Someone can take her, she can't pay her debts, she has to give herself like a slave, like a household slave, to pay off what she owes, right? Unless someone redeems her. You know, redemption is to pay the debt of someone else, remember? That's why Christ redeems us on the cross. He comes to pay the debt of sin that we can't pay. So what does God have? Let's read Hosea 3 and you'll see. The Lord said to me, so me here is Hosea, right? The Lord said to me, Go and show your love to your wife again, 
though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. That's a, that's a pagan thing. Sorry, I keep whacking this laptop with my hand. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. A lethic of barley is about 200 kilograms of barley, right? So 15 shekels of silver, that's a lot. The bride price, the standard bride price, like a dowry, the standard bride price was five temple shekels of silver. Five. So he's buying her back for three times the normal price that he could pay as a bride price. And more than 200 kilograms of grain, which in an agricultural society, it's worth a fortune, right? The two kind, the 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 um, the barley and all the rest of it, it all has significance. But that's for another day. Right? We won't cover that now. So you see, he pays an excessive amount, more than for a normal bride. So he doesn't just get her back; he goes to extraordinary lengths to get her back from her crushed and broken place where God, Hosea doesn't do that to her, God does. It's not Hosea that causes her to end up in this distress, it's God. Read Hosea too, you'll see it. But he sends Hosea to spend all this money and grain to pay off her debts, to buy her back. The Hebrew word means to gain something by trade, by exchange, one thing for another, right? So that's to redeem, to pay a price. So he couldn't just say, well, that's my wife, I'm taking her home. Uh, she had debts. Hosea couldn't just take her home. He had to pay all her debts first. That's Jesus. To get Jacob, he had to pay an extraordinary price to get her back, even though she's the most unfaithful, nasty little cow that ever was. Well, that's the apostate church as well. That's Goma. That's every Christian that still won't repent of things like Toronto. Goma. That won't repent of things like, you know, Oh, oh, don't start me. You, you, you know, because I've mentioned them a thousand times, right? All those list of things, right? Toronto's the one I hate the most, so I always mention that. But the, the list is very long. That's why God says, Go and love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. This is not human love. This is agape. This is the kind of love of God for his creation, that though he ought to just destroy it, he sends his own son to pay a ridiculous price in order to buy back rubbish. That's you and me. You know, that has no cause to boast like Goma. Points to Jacob, but it still applies to us. So just like with Jacob, it's going to be a remnant. So it'll be individuals. So you may not necessarily realize it's happening, but it'll be happening. We're different people who are maybe right now, they're still staunchly defending Toronto or staunchly defending a glacier or staunchly defending the worship of Mary or whatever it is, purpose-driven, the prosperity gospel, you know, pick one. There's just hundreds, right? So, but whatever it is, it's spiritual adultery. They are to God like a prostitute who's given herself to another God to get what they want. That's what these churches are like, by the way. They're always chasing after the next revival. They don't care about the truth. They'll just jump to whatever God, little g, offers them what they want. 
they changed their worship, they changed everything, they just changed whatever, like a prostitute. They put on any whatever dress the client wants, so long as they get what they want. That's what these churches are like, spiritual prostitutes. And the people in them are exactly like that. They're very much like drug addicts. There's a real connection between prostitution and drug addiction. They will do anything to get their money for their drugs, right? Well, that's what these these churches and the people in them are like. They're like junkies. They just forget about the truth. They forget about the real Jesus. They'll just do anything to get the spiritual high they're chasing or the power they're chasing, whatever it is they're chasing, right? Prostitutes, spiritually. But does God abandon them? No. But to get them back, he has to go with them. To get them back, he has to do something like he's going to do to Jacob to break their hard hearts. To bring them to where they say, I was better off with my real husband. Who's, a re who's their real husband? The real Jesus. Not the fake one they've been chasing after, who gave them what they wanted. You know? God is willing, and to keep his covenant, and for his name's sake, for the sake of his reputation. Remember the foolish children ruin his house? They ruin his good name? They make him a laughing stock among the nations? So that even for the sake of his name, because if he is slandered and maligned and belittled, then his faithful children start to suffer and doubt and ask, is our God real? Because the things that people are laughing and mocking are true. You know, when they laugh and mock Hosea about Goma, it's true. <laughs> so when people point to Hillsong or point to Arise or point to whatever crooked thing, right, they say, oh, Christianity, yeah, yeah, I read about that. You can't argue because it's true. Because Goma's really Goma. She's really a prostitute. She's really an awful, awful thing, right? But God came for sinners, remember? We did that last week. When Jesus said, I haven't come for the righteous, but for sinners. Well, people don't need a doctor. The doctor comes for the sick to keep a covenant. So we have to be conscious that because Goma is everywhere and her children are everywhere, we will certainly see individual cases, maybe whole churches, I don't know, that God is going to smash. He's going to do what he did to Goma to them, foreshadowing what he's going to do to Jacob, but for the same reason, for the same purpose, to bring their hard hearts and to, to crush them to dust until they can acknowledge what they've really done, until they can actually humble themselves and confess and repent and actually, probably to be truth, get saved for the first time, for real. But it'll only be a remnant. The rest will just disappear, or perish. So... Next question, is ignorance an excuse? Because remember, if you're in one of these churches, you think you're following Jesus, but you're not. You think you know the gospel, but you don't. You imagine that you're a disciple, but you aren't. But you don't know that. You know, you don't know that because you're living in a bubble where everyone around you has been told the same lie so whenever you check with them, the lie is just reinforced. So you're ignorant of your real state. That's partly why Jesus has to be so drastic in smashing it, right? To, it's actually him freeing you out of the lie. But is ignorance an excuse? Well, to a point. And we need to realize that most of the people God will send us to, especially if they are 
if they think they're Christian already, and but they believe something that certainly won't save them. We have to have the attitude of Jesus. Remember one measure, Christ-likeness. So turn with me to Luke 23 and verse 34, and Jesus says here, you know this one, he says, Father, forgive them. Why? They don't know what they're doing. What's that? Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. So, he can have compassion on them because he recognizes that they really don't understand that they're Goma. Mark 6, the same, when Jesus, this is just before he feeds the loaves and the fishes, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began teaching them many things. It's the same idea. He had compassion because he realized they didn't know. You know, they've been taught by the rabbis, they've been taught by the false teachers. They didn't know that they didn't know. He was able to have compassion, right? Able to have compassion. 2 Peter 3 verse 8 Do not forget this one thing, dear friends, when the, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And yet the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. And the elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Peter's really clear. God is patient. God wants us to be saved. But in the end, the end will come. And so, to save some people, he will have to go with them. He will have to cut them off from their idols. Cut them off from the false things they trust instead of him, he, he'll have to put them through trials that will destroy the fake world they live in. Until, for some of them, they're so crushed, they think they're going to die, and it's only then that they will finally listen. That their stubbornness will finally end. We have to understand that we need to be Hosea in that situation. Hosea reflects God, remember? God's telling him, go and do this on my behalf. Go Someone in your world, represent Jesus to them in it. Because otherwise, or if they just end up smashed, and they realize that they've done wrong, but they don't know what to do, and they don't know where to go. That's why God sent Hosea to redeem her. Because that's what Jesus will do for the remnant of Jacob. So if it happens to us in our day with someone, one of these churches, or someone out of one of those churches, or whatever, there has to be a Hosea in the, in the scene for them to be able to come back. And that's why I've shared that, because... If it's not you and me, who is it going to be? Be able, be ready. Last question. Is there a line where, even though ignorance clearly buys compassion, you know, ignorance clearly has God willing to go to pretty extreme lengths to get past that, to reach someone, even if he has to destroy their life to wake them up. But is there a point where it's just too much. Well, it's to do with accountability. Once our excuse of ignorance is gone, once we have the gospel, once we know, we can't unknow it. <laughs> once God knows that we've had the truth, it's been given to us, there's an accountability that comes with that. And
we can go, I think I'm going to skip over a couple of things because I know I've gone on for a time. We're going to go to John 9. We're almost done now. John 9, verse 39. For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and said, What, are we blind as well? And then verse 41, listen carefully. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. The fact they claimed to know God, the fact they claimed to know the scripture, the fact they claimed to know the truth, to the point where they are the priests of Israel and they can tell everybody else, right? Jesus was saying to them, because you're unteachable, because you claim to already know and you won't listen, because you refuse to listen to me, who's the word of God, right? Jesus. He says, you have no excuse of ignorance. You have the scripture and you say you understand it, you know? You say there's one God and you know him and you're his priests, right? So he's saying to them, because you say that you can see, your sin remains. You have no excuse of ignorance. What does he mean by he'll make those who can see blind and those who can't see able to see? It's to do with judgment. Second Thessalonians, God sends a powerful delusion on those who refuse to love the truth, like the Pharisees. So they claimed they could see where God's people, where God's, you know, anointed or whatever. But if they, if they refuse to love the truth, even what they can see, he will take away. He will send them into that delusion that sends them into the arms of Antichrist. It's judgment. Because, you know, he says, for judgment I've come into the world. So this is to do with judgment. Right? But those who are blissfully unaware that they're blind, they're not stubborn, they're teachable, he opens their eyes. Remember, Jesus comes to give sight to the blind, to allow cripples to walk and set prisoners free. Isaiah 61. That's what that means. But we have to be careful because we can see quite a lot. We must So I've got three things here and I think this is just about enough. finish us. Number one, we must never be complacent thinking that we've seen everything, we know everything and nothing else to learn, right? Always be humble and know that whatever, however much you know, there's more to know. You will never know it all. You will never see totally in this life. So never think that you've arrived. That will allow you to avoid getting too cocky or like the Pharisees thinking that, you know, being a know-all. Since it's clear that there is a line where the excuse of ignorance no longer applies and now you're fully accountable. But you don't know where that line is, right? Jesus doesn't say where the, you know, you've still got an excuse and now you don't. So don't even look for it because God keeps it hidden on purpose. Just knowing there is a line that you can cross somewhere should be enough to say, I won't even go there. Just what, what, you learn and what you understand and what he allows you to see, put it into practice. Don't stray. Stay in the narrow way. Whether it's your own walk or what you're teaching to other people, right? The last one is, don't be a know-all. So I've been doing this for more than 30 years and the only thing I can say categorically that I've learned is that I have more to learn than I know. You know? I'm not a know-all, I only know a bit. There's way more that I'll probably never really know in my lifetime. 
I only know the bits that God has taught me up to now. But I sure don't know enough to sit back and think, that's it, I know everything, I don't have to learn anymore. Don't permit yourself to fall into that thinking. We're not greater than the master, right? The student's not greater than the master, it's enough, we should be just like him. Well, are you completely Christ-like yet? No? It means you're still a student. You know, stay at school. <laughs> Don't think, don't think that you're the Messiah and you're not. Neither am I. So, conclusion. There's limits of responsibility. That's for our protection. Do the bit that's yours to do, like the Holy Spirit does like the servant of Abraham if they say no that's not your responsibility you are released from your responsibility if they say no if they won't come but of your free will you can try again motivated by love you can try again it's nothing prohibiting you from keeping trying you know and in God's grace and mercy eventually if he's keeping trying as well at some point that person may wake up but the important thing is if they keep saying no that was it's beyond your pay grade you know it's not your responsibility so don't take it on your shoulders as if you should have been able to save them no you're not greater than the Holy Spirit right and there is accountability for what we know so one measure Christ likeness if you go miss someone be his ear even if you are the wounded party even if it is your actual wife or husband or whatever we are to reflect Jesus who is seeking sinners repentance to bring them back don't imagine it was easy for Hosea. It wouldn't have been. He's a righteous guy, right? But he was like the good wife. He had in mind the business of his father's house, of his true husband, God's house. So he put his own agenda aside to prosper the agenda of Jesus, which is the salvation of sinners, even Goma. I think that's it for the day. It's quite a lot. You, you might have to, oops, sorry. You might have to back up and watch this in bits and pieces as usual, but that's okay. You can do that. Next week, like I say, we're hoping new generation are back. But in the meantime, I pray that God will impress things these things on your heart and mind and in your understanding that he will cause the blind to see that the gomers he will not allow to go any further but he'll hedge them off that he'll cut them off from their idols that he'll do all those things to save them and that he'll have Hosea's handy able to go and say come back your true husband wants you back okay Let's end there. Father, we thank you. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, because you did all these things for our instruction. We wait for you, Lord. We want to be the good wife, not the troublesome wife. We want to be the good children, not the foolish children. So we pray and ask for your Holy Spirit to bring to mind your word day and night for us so we can walk straight on the narrow way and be someone that you can be glad that you hung on the cross for and not sorry we ask in your name lord jesus amen that's it for me shalom good night and hopefully new generation next time